So good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar um, hosted by Maya Brown, part of the Cybersecurity uh, Month. My name is Gabriella Kennedy, and I'm joined today uh, by my colleagues, Anna Bruder and Oliver Yaros. You will see their pretty face, uh, faces on the next slide. Next slides, please. So I'm Gabriela Kennedy. I'm a partner in the Hong Kong office at Mayor Brown, where I lead the technology, uh, data privacy, and cybersecurity team. Anna is a senior associate in our Frankfurt office, specializing in data privacy and cybersecurity. And Oliver Yaros is a partner in our London office, uh, dealing mainly with data security and uh, uh, privacy as well. Our agenda for today, next slide, please. Um, is um, really issues relating to cybersecurity in the uh, three geographies where we practice. So I will kick off uh, by looking at the uh, complex legislation and matrix of laws that has been, um, uh, been passed and uh, are developing in China in the last couple of years. Uh, and after this, Anna will be looking at latest developments relating to the EU Cybersecurity Act. She will also look at the um, uh, data transfers in Europe uh, post uh, Schrems II, whilst Oliver uh, will round up by looking at the situation in the UK, again, post something, and that's something being that little thing called Brexit. We I have a few uh, housekeeping uh, issues that I would like to, to mention at the beginning. Uh, we hope that we will have a lively and interactive Q&A session. And as you are listening to us, uh, if you have questions, may I ask you to please formulate your questions and uh, uh, type them by using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you are attending the program live and if you want to apply for CLE, uh, you will find the links to the necessary uh, CLE forms in the email with the connection details that you use to access this webinar. During the program, we will be providing the code you need for the CLE request form. Uh, CLE, however, is not available if you are watching the recording uh, of this program. Next slide, please. So I will start by looking at the developments uh, in China. So over the last uh, couple of years, a number of um, pieces of legislation and regulations have emerged dealing with uh, data security, data privacy. And uh, if at the beginning they were focused, they were at a sectoral level and they were focused on the financial um, uh, sector and uh, mobile gaming and mobile app sector, uh, since 2017, when we had the um, uh, cybersecurity law come into force, we have seen a number of regulations that specifically look more broadly at um, uh, data privacy and some looking at data security. The cybersecurity law came into force in 2017 and uh, has quite strict uh, and onerous obligations on uh, two types of um, uh, operators, and they are critical inf uh, information infrastructure operators and network operators. The definition of a, uh, a CII, um, I'm going to use this term rather than using the, the long uh, term that is a mouthful, uh, really relates to uh, any um, uh, entity, any operations that, uh, if affected by a cyber incident, will have um, a, a serious uh, 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 consequence on national security uh, or the economy in general or people's livelihood or matters of you know, public interest. So think of CIIs as basically the electricity grid, uh, the utilities, financial institutions, insurance companies uh, and, and the like. However, the CSL covers all uh, other entities as well, and these fall under the category network operators. So in essence, that means any business that is connected to the internet, any business that operates um, uh, uh, by having some form of uh, network infrastructure, 
will be caught by the, by the legislation. And what does this legislation do? It requires um, all network operators and CII operators to uh, have a level of um, uh, security uh, that has been uh, assessed. So uh, that assessment takes place under the multi-level protection scheme that has five levels from one to five. The highest uh, level being one that um, uh, would, uh, would mean that any uh, incident would lead to um, a, catast a catastrophic consequence. There are certain certification requirements relating to the procurement of, of uh, critical uh, cybersecurity uh, equipment and products. Uh, and again, that depends on what level you are classified under the uh, MLPS. So the highest you are on the level, the highest the obligations will be vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, critical information, uh, critical cybersecurity equipment and products that you need to uh, have available and be able to deploy in your network. In essence, these products would have to be uh, um, supplied by um, companies that have a local license. So uh, very difficult if you are operating uh, a global network and you have a global supply chain to comply with this, uh, these provisions. There are also very strict data localization and cross-border transfer restrictions uh, that um, uh, are different depending on whether you are a CII or whether you are a network operator. Uh, there are also security requirements imposed on uh, CII operators uh, that um, require you to um, uh, comply with quite uh, uh, onerous um, uh, rest restrictions. The uh, CSL also has data privacy uh, provisions. So um, even though the, this legislation really is about cybersecurity of networks and the security of networks, it also focuses on uh, personal data to the extent that that data could be affected in the event of an incident. So the requirements that you have under the CSL relate to the collection, storage, transmission, use of personal information. There are also cons consent requirements and data localization and cross-border data transfer restrictions. Um, they, you know, uh, require that um, you obtain consent. They require that uh, you um, actually um, have a, an assessment of the um, of your systems before you can transfer uh, data across borders. They require that this assessment may need to be reviewed annually, depending on the volume of data that you're trans uh, that you're transferring across borders. Uh, and of course, there is an um, uh, even if you, if you comply with all of these um, uh, requirements, there is a possibility uh, that uh, all of this could be reversed if there is a, a, a reason for the regulatory authorities to suspect that uh, there may be non-compliance or they, they, the risk vis-a-vis uh, -vis the security of the networks would have such an impact on national security that the transfer uh, would need to be reversed and would not be uh, accepted. There are also some uh, individual rights to correction and uh, erasures that have been formulated under this legislation, and in particular under guidelines that have been issued uh, under the CSL. So the CSL, you know, in short, uh, requires, you know, a lot of um, uh, assessments that have to be done individually, but also in conjunction with the authorities and the authorities being the PSB, the Public Security Bureau, or the China Cyberspace uh, Administration. Uh, and failure to uh, comply with these requirements, failure to have carried out these assessments may lead to a revocation of a license. Um, there is also uh, a requirement to notify the authorities in the event of an incident, of an intrusion into your network. So I stress that because the notification requirement under the CSL kicks in the moment you have a network intrusion or, or a suspicion of a network intrusion, not if you have access to personal data or uh, exfiltration uh, of that data. 
uh, failure to comply with a notification requirement, which has to be given in a timely manner, leads to a fine. But failure to uh, notify might also lead to an inspection by the, the authorities who might discover that you have not complied with the other obligations under the CSL, such as, for example, uh, you have not carried out the security assessment, uh, you have not done the self-certifications, and that may lead to a suspension of your business license. So cybersecurity law, quite complex, quite onerous provisions, has been in force for four years. Uh, there are many, many guidelines that have been issued. Some of them are still in draft, uh, like the uh, uh, measures relating to personal information and some relating to data security. But the advice that we give, despite the fact that such regulations and such guidelines are still in draft, is that you, uh, that any company should try to comply with them because the consequences of non-compliance are quite um, draconian. Next slide, please. So CSL in place for four years, uh, in June this year, uh, we, um, uh, we saw the coming, uh, the, the passing of the data security law, which actually came into force on the 1st of September, 2021. This legislation is interesting in that it regulates the processing of any data. So it is much broader than the CSL. CSL regulates electronic data, right? So it looks at all the data that um, is gathered during the course of doing business whilst you're using uh, a network in a networked environment. CSL has a definition of important data and includes restrictions on transfers of personal information on it and important data. And important data under that uh, under the CSL is any data that um, whose um, disclosure, whose loss might have consequences that impact national security. You will see this definition reappearing in the data security law, but it is paired with a new definition, uh, which is national core data. So it's a new definition. Um, we don't quite know. So important data under the CSL is broad, has not been given a precise definition that we know exactly what falls into important data. Important data can change um, depending on context. And it is very similar uh, with national core data, uh, which is broadly defined as any data um, that relates to China's national security, lifeline of the national economy, people's livelihoods and major public interests. Uh, there is, um, we know that further um, uh, refinement of this definition is to come uh, and that um, there will be you know, further rules uh, that will define the scope of national core data. Um, however, any uh, loss and impact on national core data can lead to fines of up to 10 million uh, renminbi, which is about 1.5 million uh, US dollars. Data security law broadens the scope of the CSL, broadens the scope of the CSL, not by just um, the fact that it, it now applies to all data, not just uh, electronic data, but includes further obligations on network operators and CII operators, such as the fact that they have to establish a data security management system which again is based on the multi-level protection scheme that we saw under the CSL. They also have to carry out data security training. They have to implement secure technical security and safeguarding measures. They have to carry out regular risk assessments on the processing of important data and for sure national core data. And there are restrictions on handling data requests by foreign judicians, judicial or law enforcement um, uh, bodies. Data security law has extraterritorial jurisdiction. So what that bullet point is basically saying, uh, I'll give an example. It's a situation where you're operating in the United States, you are in litigation, and you have a discovery uh, order uh, issued for production of documents that sit 
with a subsidiary, an affiliate that is based in China. None of that data can be disclosed and can be immediately produced in the US unless an assessment has been carried out and unless the approval of the authorities in China is obtained. And there is a further rider to that, that if there are any uh, provisions in the foreign jurisdictions where the request is made uh, that impose onerous obligations or sanctions vis-a-vis -vis China, similar measures may, might be applied, applied by China towards that foreign um, jurisdiction. So quite a difficult obligation to, um, to meet and quite a difficult um, um, restriction uh, to, to, to try and uh, contend with. Um, so that we know that there will be um, uh, further uh, refinements of this legislation. Uh, it also has some provisions relating to cross-border uh, transfer of important data, and uh, that is now expanded to non-CII operators. So if that, you know, those restrictions on cross-border data transfers of important data related mostly to CII operators under the CSL, the data security law broadens this and expands it to non-CII operators as well. Next slide, please. Of course, the law that has attracted a lot of attention recently, and the one that has you know, um, made many companies uh, sit and listen, uh, think that they need to do something uh, about it, uh, they need to review their practices and procedures in China, is the Personal Information Protection Law. I find this quite interesting, and it speaks to the fact that probably most of us have a, a, a greater understanding of privacy law than we have of cybersecurity uh, regulations. And this is why maybe not as much um, has been done in terms of being prepared to comply with a CSL as I see companies doing vis-a-vis -vis the personal information protection law. And the one thing I would say is that you cannot look at these uh, laws in isolation. In order to be compliant with the, the, the laws in China, you have to comply with a CSL, you have to comply with the data security law, and you have to comply with the personal information protection law. You just can't pick and choose because they are interrelated, as I will show you um, uh, slide, uh, a little bit later. The personal information protection law, like the data security law, has extraterritorial effect. What do I mean by that? It's a very strict law. It has been compared with the GDPR, but I would say it's probably stricter than the GDPR. So if the GDPR prohibits um, the uh, targeting uh, of people and restricts the targeting of people, with the personal information protection law in China, it's the fact that the, um, there is an offer uh, which may not be targeted at individuals in China. I'll give the example of an e-commerce website, which is a global site. Uh, and as long as you can access that site and provide some information, you are immediately within the, uh, the remit and the scope of the personal information protection law in China. So like GDPR, this law sets out rules for the collection processing of personal information. But unlike GDPR, legitimate interest is not an accepted basis of collection. So it is very much a consent-based uh, system. Uh, and the consent uh, and notification that you have will change depending uh, on the type of personal data that you're collecting. So there are heightened obligations vis-a-vis vis vis sensitive information, uh, collection of biometric data, anything to do with artificial uh, intelligence and processing, um, or anything to do with collection of large volumes of personal data. There are also data localization requirements uh, for CII uh, operators or entities pers uh, processing personal information above a specified volume. Um, 
So in order to do cross-border data transfers, I've given you there are three ways in which you can do it. Of course, the one that everybody likes and knows and would love to uh, be able to do are the standard contracts, not standard clauses, but standard contracts. However, they have not yet been specified and issued by the China Cyberspace Administration yet. Uh, the other options are to, to pass a security assessment by the government authorities. Uh, and if you are a CII, that is mandatory. You don't have the choice and the luxury of going for another option. Next slide, please. So this is just a, um, a very um, uh, easy and uh, handy comparison of the three pieces of legislation for you to see how they interact and what what is their purpose, what entities do they cover, uh, and what types of data uh, do they cover. I know that I am uh, running out of time, and because of that, I'd like to move on to my last slide, please. And that is just a few takeaway uh, points in terms of compliance. Really, you have to be aware of the extraterritorial effect of the data security law and the personal information protection law. The fact that there are potentially severe penalties under the personal data law, the penalties are um, similar to GDPR, 5% of the annual turnover. We don't know whether it's global or just local uh, or 50 million renminbi. Um, you have to do a compliance gap analysis, data mapping, um, assess the uh, data collection, use, uh, use, storage, disclosure, security practices as well, and um, consider ex uh, engaging experts to assess the classification level in relation to MLPS. If you don't do that, you're in breach of both data security and the CSL. The classification level will affect all the relevant data and network security obligations that you will have. And really, in terms of takeaways and tips, uh, we would probably advise that you should try as much as possible to minimize the data collected or transferred into the PRC. Of course, there are technical issues if you don't have a presence in the PRC to make sure that uh, this law does not apply to you by geo-blocking, for example, if you're operating uh, uh, a global uh, a website. And consider um, segregation of data systems and storage of uh, PRC data on local uh, PRC servers. Um, so that's all I have for now. I will come back uh, for Q&A and I'm gonna pass the, um, uh, the mic to Anna. Thank you very much, Gabriella. I just learned very much about um, privacy in cybersecurity provisions in China. Um, I believe you just saw the CLE code just flash through your screen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let's just uh, leave it there for a few seconds for our listeners to be able to write that down so that you can get your CLE code um, credits. Thank you so much. So now we can go against the sun, um, geographically speaking, from Hong Kong to Europe uh, before we move a bit further to the UK. And we will speak a little bit about developments in the EU. And because I fully agree with Gabriella that privacy and cyber are, go actually hand in hand, we will not speak only about cyber developments. We will also cover the huge hot topics um, in the privacy, privacy scene in Europe. So um, if we can just dive in, please, with the next slide. Um, one major development is that the EU Cybersecurity Act is now fully applicable throughout all of the EU member states as of June 2021. And this is a regulation, which means that it applies automatically, directly in all of the EU member states without them needing to do anything about it. Um, this is different than a directive, for instance, such as the NIST directive, the Network and Information Security Directive, which needed to be transposed into the national laws of the different EU member states. Um, with a regulation, you don't need that. It's just a piece of legislation that applies automatically. Um, since I mentioned the NIST directive, I might uh, try a, a brief parenthesis um, and a parallel to what Gabriella just said as well with the CSL in China. 
I think the correspondent of the CSL in China would be the uh, NIST directive in Europe and the implementation legislation of the member states. And why is that? Uh, well, because the NIST directive actually um, applies to critical infrastructure, such as water, energy, transport, and certain digital service providers, um, such as marketplaces, cloud computing, and search engines. Um, only that, however, I mean, if you compare it to the GDPR, um, it is stricter in the scope of application because the GDPR applies to anyone who's processing personal data, right? Um, just as parenthesis is closed now, <laughs> let's dive back into the Cybersecurity Act. Um, let's take a look at what that is. I find the name EU Cybersecurity Act a little bit misleading because you would expect it to contain um, privacy, um, sorry, uh, data security provisions, right? So for me as a business, what do I need to do to protect data? And what do I need to do if I have a security breach? Um, you won't find any of that in the EU Cybersecurity Act for now. What the Cybersecurity Act does is actually pave the way for further legislation to come and further um, provisions in this regard. And how is that? Well, it um, basically gives ENISA, which is the EU Cybersecurity Agency, a permanent mandate, uh, which was very needed because poor ENISA was created 2004 by a regulation and uh, it was a temporary mandate. Then there came another regulation 2008 that extended its mandate and another one, I think 2011 and 2013. And throughout 15 years of existence, um, it did not know that it would exist tomorrow. So we don't need to get too philosophical, but it indeed was a bit of a problem because as you can imagine, there are resources and staff um, that are required for an agency to work. And how do you do that if you don't know that it's permanent? So definitely a very positive thing that Inez is there to stay. And uh, the Cybersecurity Act also strengthens Inez, giving it more resources and more tasks. And one of these tasks um, is related to the second major pillar, I'd say, of the EU Cybersecurity Act, which are the certification schemes that are to be still designed by ENISA and maintained. Uh, so ENISA is, is the, the agency that is going to take care of all of that, plus um, informing the public on all of these. One thing I did not mention that is very important, however, is we're talking about ICT. So information and communications technology, products, services, and processes, which also uh, reduces its scope a little bit, right? We're not talking about all possible products and services. We're actually concentrating on ICT for now. And I, as Gabriella, would very much like to use ICT going forward. Otherwise, I would be bubbling information and communications technology throughout the next uh, few slides. Well, since we're talking about certification schemes, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. That is the second major development I would like to highlight today. There is a brand new paper that was just published by Anise in September that is called Methodology for a Sectoral Cybersecurity Assessment. And what that is, let me try, to, the name is quite scary, right? Let me try to, to explain it in simple words. This is a document outlining a pretty complex and long and technical methodology for um, cybersecurity assessments at sectoral level. And why do I say sectoral level? Well, because the idea here is, based on the Cybersecurity Act, that all levels, all market levels of ICT should be developed, should be helped by certification schemes. So starting by starting with um, systems and via infrastructure all the way to products and services that go to the end consumer, all of those market levels should have different certification schemes. And so we need to have a methodology for these cybersecurity assessments to be performed that then can then be used to create the certification schemes. I know it's a bit complex, um, but if that works, it would really be extremely helpful because the goal here is to increase trust in the end 
um, in ICT services and products through cybersecurity certification. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the content, what this methodology looks like, actually. Um, well, the first thing is ENISA wants to gain information from the sector. It wants different sectors. First of all, to take a look at the objectives in the context of ICT security from this, um, the different stakeholders in the different sectors. I didn't write all of the bullets down, but once you have all of these objectives, Actually, the methodology provides that you start identifying primary assets and the risks that are related to those. And not only abstractly with regard to ICT products and services, but actually considering, considering the concrete intended use of these products and services. And one thing that I also thought was really interesting, the methodology, while it throughout the cybersecurity assessment considers cyber threat intelligence. And perhaps it, our listeners are not aware of that, but the ENISA has um, built, developed um, really considerable knowledge in this regard. Its experts have been conducting analysis um, on cyber threats uh, for many years now. And I think that was last year um, Enisa published like a dozen of papers on cyber threats. So who are the cyber actors? What are their motivations, their capabilities? Uh, how can we protect ourselves from them? So all of this is included in the cybersecurity assessment methodology that is proposed. And what the Enisa wants is for this methodology to be applied in a pilot project, to be enhanced where needed, and then to be, if if it passes the test to be basically the formula for building up certification schemes for the different market levels. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, the, actually it all starts with understanding sectoral ICT services, systems, products. Does it, that is the foundation. Uh, really focusing on the sectors, on the levels of sectors and um, Basing everything actually builds up on a common scalable approach to risk-based security and assurance. And why is that? I also found that very interesting. The idea is that because we know we will need different certification schemes, depending on the market level and on the sector, uh, you know, by the way, sectors, I didn't mention that, uh, sectors that could be relevant here are um, network, uh, 5G, um, mobility, e-health, just to name a few that are actually explicitly mentioned in this paper. So depending on the sector, this could be a bit different, right? But the idea here, the basic idea is we need all of these certification schemes to be based on the same uh, grounds, on common principles and common um, terminology as well, so that the, they can um, information can be exchanged between them. And if that works, then we could even reuse certificates from different schemes, which would of course be great for businesses, right? Um, yeah, and what's the idea here is to promote, um, that's Anisa's goal right now is to promote the market acceptance of such cybersecurity certification. Um, what they say is if we don't do that now, um, private bodies, could start um, you know, their own certification methodology and schemes. And if they pick up, then that could be a, a catastrophe for businesses because they would need to comply with different requirements or requirements that are based on different terminologies, different standards and um, throughout the EU. That's exactly the opposite of what we want when we talk about ICT. The goal is to have a truly digital single market, and that can only be achieved if a business can get one certification that is applicable to it and provide businesses throughout the EU. And how do you get the market to accept such certification schemes? Well, a little bit of marketing, I'd say. <laughs> so first off, you need to tell the market um, why this is a good idea <laughs> um, and what are the advantages 
for the market, for market participants. Um, for instance, one thing that is true, it would support the identification of risks that are associated with the intended use of ICT systems. It would introduce a common concept for security levels and assurances and many other aspects. And I actually noted down a few others. One thing that struck me as really interesting, um, the deployment of controls could actually be coordinated between stakeholders. And there is one concrete example that is named in this paper, which is take a IoT device with basic level control and take a sectoral backend with medium level control. If you look at each of them individually, they're not that great. But if you concatenate them or coordinate them in a way that they together can actually acquire a higher level of security and protect against cyber attacks that are much more elevated. That is the goal. And in order to do that, that's also another thing that I didn't put in the slide, but I think it's worthy of mention. They, uh, ANISA has, um, the ANISA experts have um, seen that the different standards that are um, current everywhere for all businesses, like the ESO 270XX series, right, which applies to um, information security standards, and the ESO 15408, which applies to IT security evaluation, they don't speak the same language. So there are um, words that are used in both, but have different meanings in both. And there are words that are used differently, but actually meaning the same thing. So this paper contains a table that seeks to build bridges between these terms. And um, you know, I'm not an IT expert, but I'm, I believe perhaps some of our listeners who are um, would take a look at that and say, ah, that's interesting. Finally, somebody is making our lives a little bit easier so that information can really be exchanged throughout these standards. All right, that was it for the cyber aspects. If you have any questions, I'm happy to go back to them. But now I would very much like to go to the next slide, please, and dive into um, privacy developments. Of course, we will need to talk about TREMS too. Um, and I believe everybody is aware of that. But if you live in a bubble and you haven't heard of it, <laughs> which I don't believe is the case, what is this about? Well, there was a decision in July last year of the Court of Justice of the European Union saying that the EU US Privacy Shield, which was a mechanism that was used to send data, personal data from Europe to the US, it was invalidated um, because the Court of Justice took the view that US provisions that would allow, might allow US authorities to have access to personal data of EU citizens um, is not compatible with um, data protection levels in the EU and essential guarantees in the European uh, Charter. So um, that's that. <laughs> you cannot rely on the privacy shield anymore. And the second thing that this decision said is you can still rely on SCCs, which stands for Standard Contractual Clauses, uh, which is basically an agreement between the data exporter and the data importer, where the both actually undertake a number of obligations, but especially the data importer say, says, um, you know, I'm not under GDPR and my lo local law does not oblige me to grant this level of data protection, but I undertake to grant this level of data protection so you can send me your data, basically. Um, you can still use those, but because now, that's the court speaking, because now I have seen that the US does not grant a level of, of data protection that I consider appropriate, um, we cannot close our eyes to that and let businesses use SCCs and send data to the whole world. Actually, businesses need, before they start transferring data, to assess local law um, of the third country, see if there's anything in there that would impinge on the level of data protection. And if that is the case, then they need to um, assess whether any supplementary measures could be implemented to protect the data. And if that's the case, they really need to implement these measures. Next slide, please. And so that was July last year. And then November came a draft recommendation of the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, which was intended to, you know, help businesses a little bit um, with a step-by-step -step 
how to comply with SRAMS due. Um, there was a consultation. There were over 200 replies to this draft guidance. And now in June this year, there is the final version of this paper that was adopted by the EDPB. And so what are the major takeaways of the EDPB guidance is you do need to conduct local law and practices assessment in the jurisdiction where the data is transferred to. And actually not only an abstract assessment, but actually concretely to the data set that you want to export. Um, and considering also the forms of transfer, all of the technical aspects are there risks to this data? That's what we call it a transfer impact assessment. And where necessary, businesses need to implement supplementary measures for such transfers. And in the end of this guidance, there are a few use cases um, that are meant to help businesses assess what could be appropriate and effective in the different cases. One of the measures that is prominent in this paper is encryption. However, not only encryption, actually a strong encryption, a state-of-the-art encryption with the encryption key being held under the control of the data exporter in Europe. Not very easy to do, right? Because most uh, companies that provide key management services are um, international, global companies. Uh, so sometimes a bit of a challenge to do that. Um, and pseudonymization as well. So that's when you refer, you don't refer to a person by their names, right? You refer to codes or numbers. Um, and that's also a way to go about this, but also there, uh, not that easy. The requirements in the EDPB guidance are quite high for pseudonymization to be considered effective. Right, and if you come to the conclusion that you need supplementary measures, but they are not, it's simply not possible to do them. Um, in the concrete case, for example, because you need access to data in the clear in the third country, then um, this data transfer will only be lawful if you can rely on a derogation of Article 49 GDPR, something like, for example, the public interests, um, which are, of course, also very hard. Um, to obtain. There's also another guidance of the EDPB on these derogations. Uh, yeah, that's it for the <laughs> SHREMS 2 and EDPB guidance for now. Uh, also here, we have been assisting a number of clients um, navigate through these new requirements. And I expect you might have a number of questions, so happy to tackle those later on. And if we could go to my next last slide, please. Uh, of course, we cannot not mention the new SCCs, um, I personally found everything pretty well aligned between Court of Justice, EDPB, and um, European Commission, because the SCCs did come um, at a good time in the sense that it, it is now integrating, incorporating um, some of these aspects that I just dealt with um, relating to SHREMS 2 and EDPB guidance. So, the new clauses um, replace completely the old ones. Uh, you could still use the old ones in new agreements until end of September. Now you cannot anymore. So all of every new agreement that you conclude as of end of September need to use the new SCCs. Um, they have modules. To be honest, first I thought this idea is great to have modules. And then using the SCCs in practice, I find these modules are sometimes pretty complicated <laughs> and also difficult to use, to, to handle in practice because you need to scroll down to get to the module that is consistent to you. And then a few questions come up. Um, can I uh, cut off all of the provisions of other modules that do not interest me? Uh, yeah, so it's not that uh, easy to use in practice, but also here there is a, FAQ that is expected by the European Commission that is supposed to give some practical guidance on that. What else? Um, that's, you know, looking at trends and EDPB guidance, uh, the data exporter and the data Im importer have obligations under the new SCCs to assess local laws in the export jurisdiction. Um, there, you need to describe technical and organizational measures. And if you have come to the conclusion that you need supplementary measures, these should be included here as well, that of course. 
and also relating to uh, SHREMS and EDPB, if um, a public authority ha has a request to disclose data, then the data importer has a number of obligations, that is clauses 14, 15 of the SECs. And I personally thought it was great that these are in there. Otherwise, um, businesses would have to negotiate with their vendors and their customers. Um, what is the extent of this obligation? Um, so this spares us perhaps quite a lot of negotiation. And yeah, just a quick reminder that if you have old agreements that are signed using the old SECs, you will need to replace those by the new ones by the end of next year. We do have a bit of time for that though. That was it for my part. And now further uh, counter sun um, word is with you, Oliver. Hello, and thank you very much, Anna, uh, for that rundown of um, things that are going on in the EU. Um, I'm now going to talk about developments in the UK. If we could move on to the, the next slide, please. Thank you. So, what is happening in the UK? Um, well, we are now in a post-Brexit world. Um, the Brexit transition period ended uh, at the end of December 2020. So uh, following Brexit, the position that currently exists here in the UK as far as cyber and data privacy is concerned is still pretty similar to the position that existed when the UK was in the EU. So on the cyber side of things, we uh, in the UK did implement the EU NIS directive um, with our own regulations. So the network and information systems regulations here in the UK, that imposes security standards and also uh, data breach notification requirements where something affects the continuity of services being provided by operators of essential services, like in the energy sector, um, or um, with respect to relevant digital uh, service providers. We also have our own UK version of the GDPR, which governs the security and processing of personal data. So, as of the end of the last year, the EU GDPR, as existed at that point in time, was incorporated into the UK legal system. So there are now two regimes you need to think about when dealing with personal data in, in Europe. The UK GDP, G, GDPR, when data is coming from the UK, and the EU GDPR, when personal data is coming from the EU. And of course, old EU case law and guidance that was issued prior to the end of last year is still applicable in the UK. So the Schrems 2 decision that Anna was mentioning just before, that is uh, applicable in the UK and the due diligence that Schrems 2 requires in terms of data flows under the GDPR is still relevant for data flows from the UK to other places around the world. But new, new EU case law um, and guidance that has been issued in the EU since the end of last year, so, so this year onwards, is not uh, law in the UK, it is, ju it, is just per per uh, it is just persuasive only. So, um, for example, the EU Cybersecurity Act that Anna mentioned just before in the EU, that doesn't apply in the UK, as does the INISA methodology that, that Anna was just mentioning. So what we're beginning to see is the start of our divergence between what the requirements are in the EU and what the requirements are in the UK. So change is definitely on the horizon. If we go to the, the next slide, please. So what announcements has the UK government made for the post-Brexit world on the cyber and also the data privacy front? Well, there's actually been quite a few developments in this space. The first thing I wanted to mention was the UK has announced uh, cybersecurity legislation for consumer uh, products that are connected to the internet, so IoT consumer devices. This builds on a code of practice for consumer IoT devices that was launched by the UK in 2018. 
and that um, had 13 outcome-based requirements for consumer IoT devices that had been created by uh, DCMS and the NS, uh, NCSC, or the National Cyber Security Center here in the UK. The legislation that's been proposed, and the legislation was proposed in April of this year, hasn't made its way to actually be legislated yet, but the proposals are all about making sure that, that businesses are not allowed to put consumer smart devices on the market in the UK unless they comply with specific security requirements that are gonna be set out either in legislation or are designated uh, by the government. The code of practice that I mentioned earlier is likely to be one of those standards as is uh, European standards on cyber security and consumer devices. So banning things like universal default passwords, um, implementing requirements for managing reports of vulnerabilities to consumer smart devices, telling individuals how long their devices are going to be supported for. These are the types of requirements that are going to be fed in to the legislation that is being provided and manufacturers will be required to publish uh, a declaration of conformity that their devices meet these standards and importers um, will be responsible for ensuring that manufacturers that are based outside the UK, that their products are compliant with these, with these standards. So that is a development that's taking place in the UK as far as cybersecurity is concerned. Um, there's also some developments in terms of security in the online world, and that's through the UK Online Safety Bill. This is a plan by the UK government to tackle illegal and harmful content that is online, particularly on social media platforms, but also elsewhere. And it's important to note that this covers both illegal content, so uh, material that is promoting uh, terrorism or is, uh, consists of fraud or online scams or that consists of racist abuse, for example, but also is about tackling um, harms as well. So things that might be illegal, but also might be harmful to society. So disinformation, for example, or, or uh, abuse of other forms, particularly of public figures, given there have been a number of uh, high profile cases here in the UK of, of public figures being targeted and unfortunately losing their lives as a result of uh, harm in the real world that's been fed through, through online abuse. So, um, there's been quite a lot of uh, debate around the online safety bill here in the UK. Many critics say that this is a step towards online censorship. The idea is that Ofcom would be a regulator um, in terms of compliance with this legislation and they would issue a code of practice that social media sites and others would have to comply with uh, under this legislation to make sure that harms are addressed. We'll see if it makes its way uh, into final legislation. Two final things I wanted to mention on the UK side of things is on as far as data privacy is concerned. There's been an announcement in September of this year about uh, reform to the UK data protection regime. I said we've got the UK GDPR here in the UK, which largely mirrors the EU GDPR. But the UK government is unhappy with the way in which the UK GDPR works. It thinks it is too cumbersome that um, innovation is being thwarted as a result of red tape. So there's been quite a lot of announcement about an alleged GDPR bonfire that might take place um, to pare back some of the requirements and to spur innovation as far as use of data in the UK is concerned. So a dropping of some of the requirements that exist in the, in the GDPR around assessing the impact of risks that certain processing might be doing and um, weakening some of the powers and independence of the information commissioner, who's the data protection regulator here in the UK. As you can imagine, that hasn't gone down too well with the ICO, who have criticised parts of the, the reform consultation, and we'll have to see where that is going to go up. But one big issue to, um, to be aware of 
is that the UK government is very focused on data transfers. At the moment, we're in a bit of a halfway house here in the UK. We still have the GDPR restrictions on transferring data outside of the UK to other places. We haven't adopted the new EU standard contractual clauses. We still have the old EU SECs, so businesses have to choose two methods if they're transferring personal data from Europe, the new SECs for, from the EU, the old SECs for transfers from the UK. But the UK government is looking at new standard contractual clauses for the UK and is also looking at adding to the list of countries that can receive personal data from the UK without having to go through the Schrems 2 assessment, without having to look at uh, the local law requirements or even entering into standard contractual clauses before a transfer takes place. And countries mooted to be on that list include the United States. So it'll be interesting to see how that affects the transfers and relations between the EU and the UK as far as data protection is concerned going forward. So um, there is a lot of change potentially on the horizon as far as the UK is concerned. And it'll be interesting to see what happens next in this space. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Gabriella as we go through some questions. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you, Anna, for your excellent presentations. We, I see a number of questions uh, in the uh, Q&A box. I'm going to start with um, the ones that I see have been addressed to me, and then I'm going to pass on to uh, I'm going to ask Anna to answer her questions and Oliver his. We have a few minutes. Um, so um, I have a question about um, uh, whether the data protection law in China covers B2B client contacts. Uh, a very good question. In Hong Kong, for example, those are um, outside the remit of the legislation as long there as they are used in a pure B2B context. We haven't had the specification for the China legislation. So uh, given that you would have a personal information, I would think that you would still need to treat it as falling within the uh, remit of the legislation. The next question that I have relates to personal data transfers from China to Hong Kong and whether they count as a cross-border data transfer under PIPL. The answer is yes, even though we're one country, we're still two different systems, so that is still uh, a cross-border transfer. But the, the, the further question uh, uh, then is quite interesting is whether uh, PRC personal data collected in Hong Kong when the nationals are present in Hong Kong is subject to uh, PIPL. Um, so um, it will be subject to the PDPO for sure. Uh, and if you are then collecting, I'm, I'm guessing for uh, an insurance uh, purposes, that information and then are addressing um, correspondence to the uh, individual in the PRC, you will definitely putting yourself uh, within that jurisdiction. Um, so uh, an excellent um, uh, question there. We, we uh, expect to have further clarifications uh, as the um, uh, new regulations appear uh, under that legislation. So Anna, I wonder whether you would like to answer your questions now. Sure, happy to. Thank you, Gabriella. You're on uh, so I have, oh, really? Can you not hear me? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's weird. I clicked on unmute like a minute ago. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I have a question here. What can businesses expect as next steps following the ENISA methodology for sectoral cybersecurity assessments? Um, the answer to that would be, the ENISA plans to create a working group um, in order to test this methodology. So to really apply it on a cybersecurity assessment and enhance the methodology if need be. Um, my impression is also that the ENISA is welcoming uh, stakeholders that will want to get involved you know, and, and play along. So if any of our listeners are interested, keep an eye out. Um, I'm imagining there will be invitations to join this working group. Um, and after that, the idea is really to have a methodology that can be used 
for by ENISA, you know, together with stakeholders in the different sectors to create the certification schemes, which is the ultimate goal here. Um, okay, I guess since we only have one more minute, um, Oliver, do you want to reply to any questions of yours? Sure, thanks very much, Anna. So one question that was sent in about the UK is, what do we think the direction of travel is likely to be for the UK as we as we look at potential divergence from the EU rules that it has had up till now? Do we think there's going to be less or more regulation? Do we think there's going to be increased divergence? Well, that's that's a that's a bit of a crystal ball gazing question. I think there is going to be more work for lawyers. That's certainly true. Um, my guess is that. Uh, maintaining EU adequacy in terms of data flows from Europe to the UK is going to be very important for the UK going forwards. And that actually some of the changes that have been proposed in the consultation about weakening or making some of the GDPR requirements easier to comply with may not be adopted in any reforms that make its way uh, finally through the process um, at the end of this year, next year. I think where we're going to end up in the UK is going to be still pretty close to the GDPR regime that exists in the EU, but hopefully with a bit more flexibility in terms of data flows from the UK to other places in the world. That would make it easier for businesses, and we'll just have to see what happens over the next 12, 18 months to see if, if that in fact happens. So that's, that's the answer to my question on, on the UK. Thank you, Oliver. And I know we have lots more uh, questions that we don't have time to answer. Please get in touch with us, uh, email them to us, and we would be happy to answer them uh, after the event. Thank you all for uh, listening to us, for joining us live, or for listening to, um, uh, to, to the recording. Uh, please watch out your uh, inbox for invitation to add additional upcoming events in the uh, Cyber Month um, uh, uh, series of events at Mayor Brown. But thank you very much. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.